Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't choose to make art. I was actually born an artist. I started making things when I was three years old. And it's just, I think it's an addiction from another life, really. Uh, sometimes it's a blessing, sometimes it's a curse. But it's just, you know, it's like, why do people eat? It's just what I do. Well, I would say making art, at least the way I make art and writing are very similar because they're all like collage techniques. Like I have been writing screenplays for a few years and songs. And it always is about writing a verse or a scene, having a bunch of them and moving them around so it makes sense. And my sculpture is kind of the same way. <laughs> you know, it's like this is a pile of shoes on a table and I'm just sitting there playing, banging them together for hours, sometimes days, and then I see something and it grows from there. It's all improvisation. That's how it relates to music. It's just play. It's like, I mean, some musicians, you have this sheet in front of you, you read the notes, but you know, I like jazz, and you start out with the head of the song, they call it, but then it's your time to solo and it's all improv. And it's, they call it the reordering of learned information. So I'm reordering learned information. I grew up uh, doing a lot of puzzles, so this is like having a puzzle with, a, with no picture on the box. Right. So it's just a pile of pieces on the table. And I don't know what it's going to be. I don't draw it out first or I don't even have a plan other than to make something that day. So it is totally improvised. I remember when this piece was made out of real shoes, it was in three parts. And some days uh, this was one, this was two, and this was three. So some days I would take their arms and turn them down like this and lay their head down. And just something to play with in the studio. I mean, for at least a year. And then I decided to make it a permanent thing and give it a position. This is one of three. There's one uh, downtown Atlanta, Georgia, and one in the Newark Museum. In this scale, in the scale. Um, I was thinking about it uh, this morning. So I've, I've done a lot of things out of shoes, mostly since 2005. And I've done four uh, in bronze enlargements, different pieces. This was the first one. Women's shoes offer a lot. You see, got different types of toes, different types of heels. You know, if you're dealing with color, you got different colors. And then there's more, it's what uh, has been called anxious objects. Anxious object would be like a gun yeah. or a guitar. These are things that have stories before humans even touch them. I mean, as soon as you see a gun on the shelf, you know, you, you're starting to make a story. Oh my God, who's it belong to? You know, is it legal? That kind of thing. So, uh, some sports cars are the same way. So high heels are that way too, but men's shoes are not. <laughs> In world history, there are stories about women's shoes, but not about men's shoes. Even in fairy tales, you know, you think about the glass slipper. I mean, it's just, this so much it's a loaded object before I even touch it and men's shoes are not that way plus they caught my eye you know I was making art I was making a pro doing a piece for a show I had in Pennsylvania and I wanted to make it out of sneakers my son had like maybe nine pairs of sneakers so I get the sneakers he gives them to me and I'm playing with him for a couple of days and I said man if I if I only had like 50 of these it'd be amazing so I go to my local thrift store, and in the thrift store, as soon as I walk in, I see a few dirty sneakers on the table, but I see like a mountain of beautiful high heel shoes that are barely worn. So I switched that day, and that's how it all started. That's why I like the, the um, Groucho Marx, are you gonna believe me or your lying eyes? Seeing is deceiving. I like those kind of expressions about this work. I like the fact, that's why, as you know from your research, I call it perceptual engineering because I'm forcing you to see things totally different. I am confounding your mind and your imagination because your education has taught you one thing. So you see it like they did. They see the first level of intention is to make you see something else. But then their awareness, maybe even it would be called their sense of reality, makes them go back and forth like first is a shoe then it's an elbow you know back and forth and 
That's something I really like about it. I'm currently doing a project with Yamaha Guitars. They gave me 75 acoustic guitars to make sculptures. And I'm in dealing with that battle now. <laughs> Trying to... Yeah, make it go back and forth, back and forth. Um, because the, the guitar has a third element that becomes a distraction, kind of, and that's the fact that it's wood. You know, and I, I don't want that to be this, the dominating visual experience, is the wood. And a lot of people don't know these are bronze, I've experienced. They, they think that these are some giant shoes from some store display, but it's bronze. But it is, you can maintain it with shoe polish. You know, you can just get some black shoe polish and come in here and buff it up for maintenance. <laughs> Anybody who knows art will think of Rodin's piece, The Thinker. So that kind of adds to the whole mental and physical transformation for the viewer. It's kind of a smirk on the face though, like just thinking about something that makes them smirk. And the shoes do that on their own, you know. I, I don't try to mash stuff, I didn't like mash the heel in to make the mouth do that. No, these pieces are not portraits. These pieces have a lot to do with the S-O-L-E and the S-O-U-L. Mostly the S-O-U-L because um, certain objects have an obvious memory and shoes are one of those. So you take off your shoe, it kind of, after a while, takes the shape of your foot, sometimes the smell of your foot. So the shoe has a definite memory and an association. So these pieces are more about letting the shoes speak and transforming their energy into a, what would be called, not a humanoid, but a kind of a human form so people can experience it differently. Well, I wanted it to be larger, but I had to convince my dealer to pay for it. <laughs> so this is where we ended, you know. But I'm working now to get uh, another dealer to make one that's 10 feet tall. So I'll see what happens. <laughs> uh, but it's just for more presence, uh, to make it more of a large experience for the viewer. Uh, it can relate to things that are human scale differently than you can small things, you know. So, all those reasons. But if it stood up, it would probably be taller than us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the things that make us human, you know, one of them is the ability to imagine and to perceive. And sometimes education closes the door on perception and imagination. Because you'll tell me, oh, that's a shoe. And I'll never see it as anything else again. You know? So it's closed off my imagination right there, you know. So yeah, remain open, be aware of, you know, perception, reason, imagination, intuition, and memory as mental factors that are very important. And apply those five. And the sixth one would be will. So I guess apply all six of those to your life and your activity daily to maximize every experience. As the maker, they are everyday awarenesses. And uh, I guess for the perceiver, there are challenges um, because that's what it's, you know, and on one level, that's what it's about. It's about challenging your imagination. Uh, everything you read into it is based on your memory, <laughs> you yeah. know. You bring your own experiences to everything that you look at. Right, right. So, yeah, those, those things are present and important.